Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Paweł Nurowski, and I have a pleasure of opening the inaugural meeting of our uh, screen proposal, which is funded by Nor Norwegian Founds, and it is carried on in the Center for Theoretical Physics of Wars, no, of Polish Academy of Sciences and University of Norway. We are opening our screen proposal grant officially here in the city of Iwawa. And this proposal is carried on between Center for Theoretical Physics of Polish Academy of Sciences and Arctic University of Norway. And the proposal is essentially in pure mathematics, but we have some applications in physics and the proposal is mainly set in Center for Theoretical Physics. So because of that, we wanted, I wanted to start this proposal with a physics talk. But now there is, I, should, I should make some comment about the talk because for some reasons, uh, we made this conference, a joint conference between physicists and biologists. So I asked Professor Marek Demiański from Warsaw University to give us a very elementary talk about history of our universe, where we were, where we are, where our, our universe is going to. I asked Professor Demiański to make really elementary talk. So if anybody of mathematicians know much more, they should be just happily listening. <laughs> okay, so that's, so that's the first thing. The, 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 the second thing I should introduce Professor Marek Demiański. Professor Marek Demiański is, a, I would say, father of Polish School of Relativistic Astrophysics. Not only Polish school, Marek has a contribution to relativistic astrophysics worldwide, and he's worldwide known, and he's really expert about cosmology yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So I am honored to present Professor Demiański, and Marek, please give us the lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Actually, you see, my talk should be titled not the expanding universe, but discovering the universe. Because I would like to tell you how we successively gathered more and more information and started based on this information, build models, then test these models, and then finally came to a uh, very surprising, frustrating conclusion that we know really very little about the universe. But it all started when, when the first Homo sapiens appeared on this planet and looked up. And what he saw was, uh, you see, if you will go uh, in Iwawa, that's the sky over Iwawa tonight at nine o'clock, you will see this picture. So based on this picture, people started to gather information. The first and very simple was that among the object which you see, there are some which periodically change their, their position. They now are called planets, but the rest seem to be completely stable, except that there is a one point here and if you stay and look at the sky for sufficiently long time, you will discover by yourself that the sky is rotating. But no changes between uh, different objects. So it's just that this uh, view is changing without changing the content of these objects. And that lasted for something like God knows what, until the very beginning of 16th century, when uh, uh, people uh, constructed a complete, actually much earlier, that's the beginning of the uh, current era, uh, using the Greek 
philosophy, they compiled the position of the Earth plus positions of planets, which are represented by circles here, and the sphere of so-called constant stars. This was a very perfect, very nice uh, arrangement. It was also very powerful that based on these observations, Ptolemy was able to prepare an algorithm to calculate positions of all planets, all known planets there, but not only positions of all planets there, but also uh, times of solar and lunar eclipses. So it was a very powerful, very complete, uh, uh, very nice uh, situation, but based on partly of very few observations, plus this philosophical background that the objects on the sky are, are ideal. So they move along circular orbits and they are, everything is enclosed in this spherical shell of constant stars. And then came Galileo who invented a very primitive first telescope that's about 500 years ago. And when he took this very primitive instrument and look at the sky, you can only imagine how surprised he was. Because you see, when we return back to this picture, you might ask how many stars there are. You see, if you are really very patient and you sit in a very dark place, you can calculate maybe 3,000, maybe 4,000 stars and that's all. Okay. So uh, Galileo realized that we see only a very, very small fraction of the stars which extend far, far, farther away. And with the help of this telescope, he was able, first of all, to resolve the Milky Way into individual stars. And, and there was no point of counting them because there were so many. And of course, the next steps are connected with the uh, improvement in technology. This uh, Galileo telescope was this size and, 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 and this size of, 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 of lenses, okay? So uh, you can easily imagine how the uh, vision of the deep sky changed when, with invention of better and better and better instruments. So this is a picture of our Milky Way galaxy it's of course compiled uh, Photoshop compilation of pictures taken from different parts of the uh, earth by different telescopes. But here you see whole stars, okay? So uh, here only the very basic elements are shown, not even now some. Nowadays with uh, present day technology and satellite. This is a picture of a Milky Way galaxy. You don't see individual stars because there are so many. So actually the uh, in change in, in intensity of light uh, indicates the number of stars. There are about 10 million stars here on this picture. Okay. So that's how, what, what the, what, how far we went from this early times of Galileo to the present uh, state of knowledge about distribution of stars in our uh, Milky, Way, Milky Way galaxy. Unfortunately for us living in the Northern hemisphere, we are not seeing the uh, uh, large and small Magellanic clouds, but uh, and also the view of the southern, I, I am not uh, paid by any travel agency, but if you can take a trip to the southern hemisphere to look at the sky, it's really very amazing. It's really something 
worth uh, effort. Now, that's the picture of our Milky Way galaxy, but not in the visible light, but in the microwave. So it, in a sense, this is the distribution of dust in our Milky Way galaxy, but it tells you how thin is the disk of our Milky Way galaxy. Okay, one can also ask what's the size and how many stars there are in our Milky Way galaxy. From this uh, previous uh, picture, we know that there are 10 billion stars here, but based on estimation how many stars there really are, we expect, nobody counts as that, that the total number is about between 120 and 150 billion stars. Okay. So our sun is one of the incredibly big uh, 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 collection of stars, which is our uh, cosmic home. Now, where is the star? Sun is somewhere here. It's, it's about uh, 25,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. So you see in astronomy, because the distances are so incredible, we use this very special, in a sense also very intuitive uh, measure of distance. This is a light year. Imagine a photon which is traveling with a speed of 300,000 kilometers Per second, the distance with the photon traveled during the 365 years is called the light year. The nearest star is at the distance of four light years. So, of course, there is no point, you know, of communication with the extraterrestrials because uh, you know, the time it takes the signal to move from uh, our solar system to our neighbors somewhere here. Uh, probably there are some neighbors because by now we also uh, discovered mm -hmm. about 5,000 planets already uh, circling around different types of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. So if our imagination how the light emerged on Earth is correct, uh, there are probably many such places in the Way, uh, Milky Way galaxy. The next step uh, uh, motion of basic particles, but also invented the law of universal gravitation. So everything in the universe attracts each other. All masses, all stars, or galaxies, whatever there is in the universe, attracts each other. We are attracted to each other also, unfortunately, gravitation is very, very, very weak. Uh, okay, but that was a, another very fundamental step because using the Newton's law of gravity, it was possible to understand the motion of planets and motion of stars. And people realized that this largest physical object, the whole universe, obeys physical laws which we are discovery here on Earth. So based on this, it was possible now to start building models. And the next incredible discovery was the discovery of spectral analysis. So when finally Bunsen and Kirchhoff discovered that every substance which is heated to a gas state or heated just sufficiently strongly emits light, this light contains information about the basic constituents of this element. So that opened up a possibility of asking questions like what's the chemical composition of stars? And everything was emits light, light in the visible in the visible universe. So obviously, of course, very soon astronomers started to look at the spectra of different stars. So this 
is a spectrum of, uh, of our sun. You see, now with the very great resolution spectrographs, we identified about 150,000 lines in the solar spectrum. So based on these uh, positions of these spectral lines, we know now that, star, that sun, but not only sun, but all the planet, all the stars which we see are composed mostly on uh, uh, hydrogen and helium. Also, based on the distribution of uh, energy along the spectrum, we can, we can see this energy spectrum. And from this, we can actually nowadays estimate the temperature of the star with accuracy of about 10 degrees. Based now on a, looking at the shape of individual uh, spectral lines, we can also uh, extract information about density and pressure in the upper layers of stars where this radiation is coming from. So now with this invention of spectroscopy, we got really an incredibly rich instrument which provides us with many very interesting information about composition and motion of stars because also we observe the shift in the position of spectral lines and this shift is typically uh, related to the relative motion of an observer and the source of light and through Doppler effect, we can study the motion of stars with, in our Milky Way galaxy. It was really a big surprise when astronomers realized that all the stars are composed of mostly two elements. And the simplest element, hydrogen and helium. And of course, it's very natural to ask why is there a reason? And it turned out that in order to explain the reason, I will come to that point later on in my talk, it, it was necessary to look really at the history of the evolution of the universe. So now the next uh, very important step occurred about 100 years ago. Only about 100 years ago, Edwin Hubble, who is represented here on this picture, sitting on this, at that time, largest optical telescope in continental US at Mount Wilson, close to Los, Los Angeles, was able to look at Andromeda Nebula, as it was called at that time. And then in the Andromeda Nebula, he was able to spot individual stars. So from that time, Hubble realized that objects which were called, at least most of the objects which were called nebulae in the previous day astronomy are actually a huge concentration of stars. So in a sense, from the 1923, Hubble discovered this incredibly rich uh, set of external galaxies. Then, using this telescope among the stars which appear in this nebula, he was able to spot so-called C-phase. These are a special types of stars which periodically oscillate. Nature is very kind to astronomers because this period of oscillation is between few days and few months. So you don't have to spend night by night by night looking at the telescope to observe how the intensity of the star is changing to discover this characteristic plot of luminosity changes. And since this is characteristic from the maximum of the luminosity, or rather the period, you can estimate the maximum luminosity and from maximal luminosity, 
you can estimate the distance. And it was actually shocking when Hubble realized that this nice object is at the distance of about 2.5 million light years from our Milky Way galaxy. But that's, except of small and large Magellanic clouds, is the most, is the closest neighbor, okay? So the distances between galaxies are unimaginable. It's very difficult, you know, to imagine a distance of few million light years. Hubble also noticed that galaxies that the spectral lines in the spectra of galaxies are shifted. For most galaxies that are shifted toward the red part of the spectrum, indicating that the galaxies are moving away from us. And after you see collecting the data for something like uh, 30 maybe galaxies, he was brave enough to postulate that there is a linear relation between the distance and the velocity. So this was the the, another very important discovery that this incredibly complex system, our whole universe is evolving. That the galaxies are moving away from us, the universe is expanding. Now, of course, that's a, a data from 19, 25. Now, with present day telescopes, we go farther and farther and farther away. And as you can see from this diagram here, everywhere, this linear in the first approximation relation between the distance and the velocity holds. So, from the dynamical point of view, the universe, in a sense, is very simple. Well, in order to go deeper, of course, it, is it was necessary to wait until technology will develop. And fortunately, in the last 50 years, we observe a real jump in the technological poss possibilities of observing the sky. First of all, we have satellites. So we can get above this unpleasant Earth's atmosphere, which is causing, you know, fluctuations of these very faint objects, which we want to see. Then, nowadays, we learn how on Earth to build much bigger, much larger telescopes. And here is our European proud. You see, this is the largest telescope on Earth. This is a system of four telescopes with mirrors of eight meters in diameter, which are connected together through uh, uh, fiber light. And uh, effectively, we have a telescope with an absorbing power of 32 meters. Hmm? Paranal Chile. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. No, 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 but there is a very good reason. You see, this is the best observing site on Earth. So the next uh, step in technology was the invention of segmented mirrors. So this is a mirror of a very large telescope with a with a diameter of about 10 meters. It is not one uh, solid surface, but it is composed of segments. Segments are thin, so they can be adjusted. So now, based on this possibility, and of course, very powerful computers, it is possible to adjust the shape of the mirror to the object which you see and to the state of fluctuation in our Earth's atmosphere. And of course, the next 
uh, invention is the so-called coupled charge device, which is a photon detector. Our eye is an incredibly fascinatingly good optical instrument, but its efficiency is about 60%. So 60% photons, which are coming to your retina, are actually registered. With this device, we can nowadays register about 99% of photons which hit its surface. So with this incredible technological devices, let me now return back to this root of constructing models. You see, in 1922, even before Havel discovered that they, there are different galaxies, this unpretentious guy, Alexander Friedman, solved the Einstein equations which describe the evolution of a very simple system in which matter is distributed in homogeneous and isotropic way. And it turned out that with this very great uh, restrictions in uh, uh, distribution of matter, there are only three possibilities. Actually, when you look at this diagram, it seems that there are two. Either the universe will expand to some maximal state and then recollapse or will expand forever. This solid curve is the boundary between this set of parameters which leads to the recollapsing universe and set of parameters which lead to the universe which will expand forever. Our universe, from the best estimation of parameters we know, sits somewhere here now. So it will expand forever. But you see, another great discovery of this Friedman model is not that that it, uh, based on this Friedman model, you can derive the Hubble equation, the relation between the velocity which, which galaxies are moving away and their distance. But also here, if you look at this diagram, you see a very deep consequence. There was a beginning. A universe, at least, you know, described by these classical equations of general relativity started, and now we know it started about 13.6 billion years. If you, if you apply also a conservation law of matter, then immediately you will come to the conclusion that here, the density of matter was infinite. If you are a physicist, then you clearly immediately understand that if the, if, if the density was tending to infinity at this state, temperature was also tending to infinity at that state. So this was the starting point of the model, which we now call Big Bang, that the universe started its evolution from a state when the density of matter was very high, formally infinite, and it was also very hot. At first, this conclusion sort of seemed completely out of real physics. Singularity as an initial state of the universe is not acceptable. But fortunately, not everybody was so skeptical. In late 1940s, another Russian great physicist, George Gamow, who was at that time, who also participated in the invention of genetic code, uh, uh, 
ask the following question. If gamma of is if Friedman is right, then at this very early stage, when the matter was condensed to a very high uh, density, there were no place for atoms. There were no place for atomic nuclei. They were no place, as we know now, for protons and neutrons. Everything was smeared out into the most elementary constituents. So in early in late 1940s, Gamow asked the question, what will happen when you start with a universe which is very dense and very hot, and at that time, 1940, composed of the most elementary constituents. For, fortunately, at that time, there was only very few. Proton, neutron, photon, neutrino, electron, okay? Just five. How from this mixture, very hot and very dense of these elements, all this complicated stuff was created. So it was necessary to look at the evolution of this uh, and looking at the possible thermonuclear reaction at the very early stage, estimate how many different elements are able to, were able to be produced. It turned out that with the, uh, at that time, uh, parameters, basic parameters of the evolution of the universe, it turned out that only actually helium can be produced with some admixture of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, lithium, and that's it. And that's the explanation why now we see that most of the stars are composed of hydrogen and helium because the so-called primordial matter, which resulted from the Big Bang, that was its uh, chemical composition. 75% of hydrogen and 25% and of helium. Now, based on this information, how many different other light elements were produced in the uh, expanding universe, it was possible now to measure the composition of primordial matter in the universe. And in that way, it was possible to actually weight the universe, to estimate how many baryons, the stuff from which we are all built in, Contain, is, is contained in the universe. You have to have some unit of measure to decide whether it is small or large. So cosmologists decided that this unit of measure will be the density of universe, which is flat, which is ex, which re, it's represented on this graph of Friedman models by a solid curve. And it turns out that our universe contains only about 4% of what is known as the critical density. Very little, very small amount. No, 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 no. Only 4% of so-called critical density. But since our universe, as we know now, as, as I, I think, as, as, as we think that we know now is flat, that's correct. That only 4% of matter in the universe is the matter from which we are building. I will come to this point later. Uh, 
the critical density is the density of matter in the flat universe. You see this curves in the in the in the model here. Uh, the, 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 the depend on on critical density. The only parameter which distinguish between different uh, models is critical is the density of the universe. So this one, the universe which is flat, the density of that that matter is called critical density. Hmm? Of all this through all this curve. Now, yes. Hydrogen or helium, I understand it's a gas, but mm -hmm. suddenly so much lithium here. Why why it appeared? Well, because it was created in the very early stages of and the evolution. Of is the there any reason why just huh? is there any specific reason why just this heavy metal? Well, you see, you just you just look at this diagram here, okay? Okay. So you have to solve. You have to solve. Taking back to mathematics, okay? Really? You have to solve a set of complicated, different couple of differential oh, okay. equations, okay. Okay. okay? Which tells you how many different. Uh, nuclei will be formulated from this very early stage when there are protons and neutrons only. But the message is that we cannot go higher. We cannot have. No, we cannot go heavier. higher. We, cannot have heavier. We, we don't have heavier elements because you see the universe is expanding. Okay. So the density, which is the critical parameter in the equations which relate to different. Uh, elements uh, is very quickly decreasing. So there was just not enough time to create heavier elements than carbon and oxygen. But we have gold, I know. Huh? We have gold. Oh, yes, but that's that's <laughs> great, you see. <laughs> but gold is created as we know now uh, in an, uh, <laughs> dramatic explosions, okay? supernovae explosions and so forth and so forth. So I'm not going to touch this here. But if you would like to know where, where there is, you know, the largest, uh, uh, the largest place in the universe, which contains most of the gold, I can tell you later. <laughs> Just privately, you don't have to pay for that information. Uh, you see, uh, the next step, and the next prediction, very important, of Gamow was that if the universe initially was very dense and very hot, then though the universe is expanding, photons as quantum particles live forever. So there should be now a remnant, a kind of a quantum fog, photon fog, in the universe, which is the remnant of this phase when the universe was very dense and very hot. And you see, uh, completely unexpectedly using this very primitive big uh, radio antenna, these two American uh, uh, radio engineers, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, discovered that this antenna is picking up some very weak signal in the microwave range of frequencies, no matter how it is oriented on, on the sky. And when uh, they read the uh, data, no matter whether it is day or night or orientation of the telescope. And then they realized that what they discovered was this remnant of the Big Bang. You see, this is a curve represent, representing uh, Planck 
equilibrium temperature distribution at, of a body at the temperature of 3K. These are the first observational points. At the beginning, you know, during the first maybe two or three years, it was not sure whether it is really a black body or maybe just a really jinx part of the complicated electromagnetic spectrum. Now, I remember myself, I was watching that this experiment going on in 1980, an American satellite, which was called COBE, which was set specially to observe the properties, basic properties of this microwave background radiation set back the information about the spectrum of this radiation. So what you see here is the spec Planck spectrum of a body with temperature of 2.728 plus minus 0.004 K. So that's how well now, actually now we know this temperature with a slightly better accuracy, but you see the accuracy is much better than the thickness of this curve, which you see on this diagram. That was really a very amazing discovery because first of all, it showed up that the universe at the very early stage was very dense and very hot, but also the universe evolved in a very peaceful way. Once it was created, this whole process of primordial nucleosynthesis and then formation of structure was very peaceful. No events in which large flux of photons was released. More than that, when you look now at the temperature of this microwave background radiation and measure this temperature with an accuracy of 10 to the minus 5K, you will see subtracting the contribution from our galaxy and subtracting the contribution coming from the Doppler effect that we are moving with respect to this microwave background radiation, there is a small remnant. This blue and orange points represent points which are slightly warmer and slightly colder than average. The relative difference is of the order of 10 to the minus five. So what you see here is a picture of a baby universe. That's how matter was distributed in the very early universe when the universe was about 340,000 years after the Big Bang. That's the moment when universe expanded so far that the temperature dropped to about 3000 degrees. And at that temperature, electrons and protons could combine to neutral hydrogen atoms and therefore the free path of a photon is becoming infinite. So you see that's in a sense <coughs> proof that this initial assumption of Friedman that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic is basically correct. So we are very lucky. Our universe, you see, is very simple. Well, the next big question is how from this very simple <coughs> picture, which you see here, form this very complicated picture of galaxies and clusters of galaxies, which we are observing now. <laughs> but this is a perfect 
initial condition. Based on this, because these objects, which are slightly colder, at also, are also slightly denser. Because of that, now the gravity <coughs> has a long time to work. It contracts everything, attracts everything, but mostly in those blue spots here. And from these blue spots, gal galaxies, stars, and all these complicated structures which we see forms later. So now based on this, you see again, coming to the, to the, uh, um, mathematical side of this picture. What you see here is a function of temperature, how the temperature is changing all over the sky. So this is a function F, which depends on theta and phi, on two positions on the sky. For mathematicians, this is just, wow, great. We do a Fourier transform, okay? We expand this into spherical harmonics and then, <clears throat> Once you have spherical harmonics, you can plot the square roots of spherical harmonics at different multiple moments, and then form, they form this curve. From this curve and the model, we can read off, as I will show you in a moment, basic parameters of our universe. <clears throat> now, it's another picture of a very nice galaxy. <clears throat> it's a spiral galaxy. It is oriented in such a way that you see uh, sp two spiral arms very well developed. And it's not necessary to be astronomer or physicist to realize that the system is rotating. Okay? So once it's rotating and it is stable, it survives from several billion years, we can apply the same principle as governs the velocities of planets around our sun. So this is a Keplerian law. <coughs> the planets which are farther away are moving with a slower and slower velocity. And this is the characteristic one over square root dependence. So why don't we try to look how stars are moving in, in a spiral galaxy? And then you see when astronomers were able to measure this velocity, it turns out that stars and galaxies move very differently from planets around our sun. This rotational velocity, instead of decreasing as one over square root of r, is slightly increasing or stays almost constant. The reason for that is that there is more matter than the matter which we see. And Based on this, we can estimate what's the total amount of matter in the in galaxies. Also, there are independent ways of measuring the mass of galaxies and clusters of galaxies coming from a very sophisticated effect of general relativity. As you know, uh, one of the predictions of Einstein, Einstein's general relativity is that photons do not travel along straight lines, but they are bent in a, a strong gravitational field. So once they are bent, they form so-called gravitational lenses. And by looking at the in the shape of distant galaxies, it is possible it was really a big surprise to find out that, sorry, but not me, uh, that 
galaxies contain a large amount of matter which is not visible. There are more even invisible uh, matter if you look for, if you look at clusters of galaxies. This invisible matter cannot be baryonic because we know that there are only 4% of critical density in the form of baryon. This dark matter forms about 23% of the critical density. So that was one of the biggest surprises in modern cosmology that actually when you look at the dynamics of these big objects, you discover that there is a lot more than what we see. In 1997, a group of astronomers decided to check another uh, obvious prediction of the Friedman model. Since gravity is a universal force, the gravity acts between galaxies in the universe also. So if they are expanding and there is attraction between galaxies, the rate of expansion should slow down. So astronomers were trying to check if the universe, the expansion of the universe is really slowing down. Unfortunately, in order to measure that, it was necessary to look at the very distant objects. Unfortunately, by 1997, astronomers realized that nature provides us with an unexpected standard candle. You see, among binary stars, there is a special family, which is white dwarf and a standard star forming a binary system. We know from the evolution of the binary systems that binary that uh, white dwarf cannot have a mass larger than 1.4 times the mass of the sun. The white dwarf, the mass of this white dwarf is constantly increasing because it's fed up, fed up by matter coming from the normal star. When this white dwarf will reach this limit of 1.4, it is exploding in a form of so-called supernova type 1A. It's an incredibly bright explosion visible from very large distances. So when finally in 1997, astronomers started to search for such very distant supernovae type 1A, they discovered surprisingly that instead of slowing down the acceleration of the universe, the expansion rate of the universe is accelerating. And then, it was, again, a natural question, what's causing this, ex this accelerated expansion? You see, now we don't know. But one simple explanation is that Einstein was right in 1917 when he created his very primitive, we know that it is not correct, a model of a static universe. And in order to make the universe static, it was necessary to add some force which will counterbalance the gravitation attraction. This additional force is called cosmological constant. So it's now we think that our universe has a different from zero cosmological constant. Well, you see, this effect of accelerated expansion can be created also by different uh, physical reasons. It could be cosmological constant, it could be vacuum energy of all the quantum fields which exist in nature, but 
the problem with vacuum energy is that uh, the estimates are something like 20 orders of magnitude of the predicted value of the cosmological constant. We don't know why. Could be potential energy of some, you know, physicists are uh, very inventive people, so they invented a few different models, but uh, they, it's an open question. Now, of this uh, spectrum of the microwave background fluctuations, cosmologists were able to calculate uh, values of all basic cosmological parameters. So now we know that uh, what's the uh, Hubble constant, what's the value of the uh, uh, cosmological constant, how much matter, dark matter there is, uh, I don't know, what's the age of the universe, uh, you know, basic, whatever, whatever parameter you can think of uh, using this microwave background radiation information we can calculate the value of this, uh, of this parameter. Also, you see uh, all these different observations, cosmic microwave background radiation, supernovae of type 1a, uh, distribution of matter in the universe, come up to this conclusion that our matter, our universe contains, first of all, cosmological constant or dark energy, this something which is causing the accelerated expansion of the universe and dark matter. Of course, the relative uh, relations between dark matter, dark energy and standard matter change during the evolution of the universe, but that's, that we understand that we can explain that's not a, a puzzle anymore. So here are, again, a table of some basic uh, parameters of the universe. Uh, I would like to point out uh, at few. First of all, this omega total, which is the curvature of the universe. One uh, means flat universe. So that's how well we know that our present day universe is really flat, that it contains some dark energy, that it contains some dark matter, that it's composed now mostly out of photons. There are about, as you can see, 400 photons of this microwave background radiation per cubic centimeter in the universe. The relative abundance of baryonic matter and photons is, as you can see, 10 to the minus seven. So baryonic matter is practically uh, invisible on the scale uh, of the universe. Then the uh, age of the universe, 13.7, billion years, uh, et cetera. Now, based on this, we constructed a, a model starting from the beginning to the present day, which uh, quite nicely is described by this assumption that the universe on a large scale is flat. It's composed of mostly dark matter and dark energy and the proportions between dark matter and dark energy at it's like 72% of dark energy and 28% of uh, dark matter. And that's, this is one can tell you a basic conclusion of my talk. You see, when I am looking at this diagram, <clears throat> It always puts me into a very frustrating stage because you see, based on observations of this normal matter, 
we learn that there is much more, that there is dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter is probably in the form of some strange particles, which are very weakly interacting, very, very weakly interacting in a standard matter, because up to now, though many different efforts, we were not able to discover either particles of dark matter individually or create in our most powerful accelerate, accelerator particles of dark matter. Dark energy is even more frustrating because we really don't know, okay? Maybe it's a cosmological constant, but then, then we don't understand why the value of the cosmological constant which we can, which we can measure is so much off the estimate which we can make based on our principal information about the uh, quantum fields uh, which exist in the universe. So big question. You see, when you, when you look now at this whole picture, there are really big questions, very frustrating. This first is very simple. It says why there is something rather than nothing. You see, it's a based on this, on this Gamow's idea that the universe at the very early stage was very dense and very hot and everything was smeared out into most elementary constituents. So if you assume that it's all started from a ball of very hot radiation, very hot photons, and then matter and particles were created from energy content of these universe, from what we know in physics, this process of spontaneous creation of matter will create equal amounts of matter and antimatter in the universe. At first, it looked that there is a possibility that maybe, you know, some different parts of the universe are formed from antimatter, some different parts of the normal matter. Now, observing the background of X-ray radiation, we know that this scenario is extremely real. And we don't understand when, why we really exist why in the process of the evolution of the universe in a natural way more variants were created than antivariants then the next question is the nature of that matter what is it we expect that it is sort of very weakly interacting particles because we observe that dark forms a dark matter light. And we can even estimate very, based on the very primitive estimates, uh, uh, mass and temperature of this dark matter particle. Then the next is the nature of dark energy. We don't know what it is. If you can get any idea, please let me know. It will really be a great news. And then, of course, even deeper philosophical question, how it all starts. You see, we know that the very early stage of the evolution of the universe was very dense and very hot, but we don't know how it all started. And that's another you see, very frustrating uh, state. And I would like to leave you with, with this picture, which I showed you already. You see, this is the deepest part of the universe ever seen by human being. This is so-called extremely deep Hubble Space Telescope picture. Every of the objects on this picture, no matter how small, is a galaxy. You see, by now, this picture was taken about five years ago. By now, astronomers identified about 15,000 galaxies on this picture. 
each this bright spot on this picture is composed of stars and it contains about 15 billion stars. It's expanding. It's incredibly rich. And from our human perspective, it's very natural to ask, what's the purpose of this whole stuff? What for? Why? We will be very happy in our Milky Way galaxy. Enough stars, enough uh, matter. Why such a ability of galaxies and different forms of uh, matter distribution? What for? So I leave you with this picture, look at it and try to for a little while, think about where we are, what we are doing here, and what this universe, this big, huge universe, is doing. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this beautiful talk. So now we have time to, for questions. And any question is possible, any. Uh, can I ask from Tromsa? What could be dark matter? Is, is it gas? Is it uh, something which is not bright, like not stars? What, what is really this concept well, dark of dark matter? Means, dark matter means that it is not emitting electromagnetic radiation. Okay? It, it, pro it probably interacts with standard matter, but very little. You see, one of the, uh, of course, uh, particles which were no. not particles which were even not seen in our no not seen in any in, in any a, high energy uh, but it's very speculative it's very speculative not, not seen in any high energy collision it's very speculative yes the point is that they that yes. that that they yes. see that they should be this mass, but well, we why, don't know what is this why, mass. Why, why it is seen there should be this dark matter. This I never no. understood. No, it was, it was thought that it, that it stopped. There were these curves. Like, Can you show these curves? Yeah. You see this? Yeah. Yeah. This and, and is the like, one before, and the one before, Marek. This. You see, that's, that's how planets are moving around our sun, OK? And uh, we know that Sun is the most massive object uh, in, in, in our solar system. When you, when you now look at galaxies, okay, uh, the center of the galaxy is the brightest part. So astronomers at first thought that this is the region where most mass of the galaxy is concentrated. Okay, natural, obvious. But when they started to measure, and test, it turned out that the velocity of stars, these points are how stars are moving around. You see, our sun is moving around the center of our Milky Way galaxy. That's for Guaje, you see. Look, can you imagine you see what's moving here in your, your moving to the velocity of 200 kilometers per second? How do we how, how do we know that, for example, it's not like from black holes or some like uh, terms that are not that are close enough that are not emitting? There is not a simple answer to that question, but but there are there, there, there is a reason. You see, you look uh, 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 we know that at this very early stage of the evolution of the universe, of the evolution of the universe, the matter in the universe is still a very limited matter. In order to form, to form black holes, you have to have a large scale fluctuation in the mass, not to be that. That's, that's but it's, it's, it's some like it's some like model, it's not like a straightforward measurement. No, 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 no. So it may be very different parameters. Very yeah, different yeah, yeah. yeah, sure, sure, sure. 
but just just you know simple answer is that we would like to have some questions from zoom from listeners outside iwava hello hi can i ask from tromsa yes please uh so please can i ask, uh, uh this uh, at the beginning you discuss uh, you, you explained uh, the distribution of visible matter 25 percent of helium 75 percent of uh hydrogen uh but that's in in our universe uh what happens if you change uh, the curve right on this picture where you show density uh, and then there's like expanding universes or expanding which turns out to be collapsing universes depending on this curve can you say what happens to distribution of visible matter you see uh, coming back to this to this very basic uh, models of the universe. We have universe which could expand to some maximal scale and then recollapse or, or expand forever. From the present day observational data, we think that our universe will, at least for some while, follow this straight line. But these models here are based on assumption that the universe does not contain dark energy. So if there is dark energy, even this curve here will turn up. So it will start to expand faster and faster. It leads to another, you see, very frustrating question. What's the final state of the universe? Okay. If it is expanding and expanding and expanding faster and faster and faster, it seems that all galaxies will be torn apart, all stars will be torn apart, all planets will be torn apart, all atoms will be torn apart, and the very, very, very distant future is very uninteresting. It will be cold and composed mostly on practically massless particles. Also, it doesn't matter actually. They will be not squished anyway. Or is like to add something? Uh, well, I, I mean, uh, our question was not about uh, future, but about like initial stage. And is there any possibility for different distribution of visible matter? Not like 25 per 75. Uh, well, you see, based on what we know and what we see, these... Uh, so the experiment and these measurements are very precise. So, so uh, uh, I can, uh, if you if you look at the at these figures here, seventy three percent dark energy and uh, twenty seven percent uh, dark matter, including four percent of baryonic matter. Uh, these numbers, I think, are very safe. So, so Mark, did I correctly? That you are saying that simply this this twenty five percent till seventy five percent is some some experimental fact. We cannot change it. This is this what we know, right? Yes. Okay. No, no. That that's that. These are numbers which are coming from real measurements. It's a not. Uh, but they are coming, you know, from some theoretical model. If that's not possible to predict. Then it will come up to this. Any other question? Here or there? Or uh, may, far may, away? Maybe I had one. Yeah. Yes, please. If, uh, so so uh, in in one of your slides, you, you had a, a time, time scale of uh, the universe and the I think the, the first bit was the this inflation, the so-called inflation. Can you say something about it? La, 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 la. <laughs> you see, well, 
So, so it seems that this back one of the problems you see one of the problems which was created by when 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 we got finally this picture is uh, is the following. You see, uh, when you look at the sky and you look at two different sections of sky with uh, angular separation of about twenty degrees, the photons which are coming from these two parts of the sky. According to the standard Friedman model, have never uh, sorry, it keeps keep um, cutting off. So, Arman. It, it, sorry, it's, it, it, it keeps keep cutting off, so I couldn't hear what oh, was. So, you see, um, um, the way out was to invent a very short stage at the very early uh, epoch of the evolution of the universe, which we now call inflationary era. This was a time when, again, we don't know what. So that's, you see, a sign of a state of cosmology. That's a, almost a fantasy story, okay? Uh, uh, there was some field, which we call inflaton, which was causing accelerated expansion of the universe. This accelerated expansion of the universe uh, smoothed it out all previous, uh, uh, yes, all previous uh, inhomogeneities, but also because of the quantum nature of this phase of the evolution, small quantum perturbations were created and actually one of the big successes of this inflationary paradigm is that they were able to, to predict the spectrum of the, the properties of the spectrum of the initial quantum fluctuations in the universe and also explain its statistical properties. When you look at this picture of these uh, fluctuations here, they are random, they are Gaussian. One of the characteristic feature of quantum process of creation of such uh, fluctuations. So maybe, maybe our real origin of the universe is really quantum. We don't know yet. More questions? Yes. Is one more question acceptable? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Please, Bronek. Uh, you are supposed to be here. I'm sorry. Uh, given the scenario that uh, our universe is expanding and it's faster and faster, and in some sense it will eventually die. In some sense, yes. Uh, how? How can one say how this will influence us? Uh, that means our galaxy, for example. Other than the predictions on this, because well, it's it's nice to observe more and more stars and, and see them, etc. But if they will just disappear for us, basically it will be not that. Just a catastrophe. Uh, so it's very, very important for us well, what, what will happen with see, our galaxy. We are now talking about cosmological scale. So we are not talking about how the universe will look like or how we will look like a million years from here. We are talking about time scale measured in hundreds of billions of years. Uh, we don't know uh, how 
uh, matter will disappear. We don't understand how matter will form, and also we don't know how it will finally disappear. But what is clear from this predictions is that the basic forces which we know, electromagnetic, gravitation, and weak and strong forces will be not strong enough to bind atoms, planets, etc. So everything will be smeared out into very basic elementary constituents. Sorry for this. <laughs> Any I'm other question? Prediction, but... Any other question? But uh, in other words, it's, it's not possible to, to say what will happen with our galaxy. Mm -hmm. Say it again, Bronek, please. It, it, it... So it seems that uh, we are not able to predict what will happen with our galaxy. Well, you see, uh, if the dark energy is cosmological constant, okay, then in about 120 billion years from now, our galaxy will disperse in outer space. The distances between stars will be so large that they will be no bound gravitationally anymore. They will start so-called free fall, free ride through a, a intergalactic space. And then if you wait another uh, 120 billion years, stars will start to disperse, etc., etc., up to atoms and atomic nuclei, and then protons and neutrons. Any other questions? Maybe here, maybe there. If not, Thank you very much, Professor Demiansky. It was a very beautiful talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>